Welcome to another episode of the Asian Seller Podcast. I'm your host, Meghla Bhardwaj. And today I've got Melissa Simonson and Hi Mag from Eva. Hi, how are you doing, guys? Doing so good. Thanks, Meghla, for having us on. Thank Thanks for having us. Yeah, thank you so much for joining me over here. And um, we're going to be covering a range of topics. Uh, we're going to be talking about Amazon India because Eva has recently launched their platform for Amazon India. Very fast growing marketplace, very interesting, very different from all of the other marketplaces out there. And we're going to be talking about some of the trends that you guys are seeing based on all of the data that you have at Eva. So very interesting uh, topics. But first of all, let's do introduction. So Melissa, of course, everybody in the industry knows you, but in case people have been living <laughs> under a rock, <laughs> just give us a bit of an introduction and also tell us about Eva very briefly. Absolutely. Um, so I'm Melissa Simonson. Uh, I, for, most people know me from my time at Empower E-Commerce Cooperative. Um, I was a general manager and we built that as a nonprofit co-op to help sellers succeed in business and in e-commerce and to just give entrepreneurs sort of a, a lighthouse to uh, navigate the rough seas of entrepreneurship. <laughs> and, um, and I made a recent change to, um, to move to Eva because it's one of the most, I think, innovative things that I've seen in e-commerce. I've, I've seen a lot of different tools that, um, you know, it will focus on one thing. And for sellers, still, you have to then compile a lot of data and, and then that drives your decisions. And so I, I was very excited to make this transition to Eva as the head of marketing because um, it's so easy to talk about Eva. It's so easy to sell because it's, it's combining several different resources that sellers really need. Sellers need to be able to manage their pricing, whether they're reselling or whether they're um, private label. They need to be able to jump in and change their pricing based on their stock limits, their, you know, uh, just a number of factors, right? Their competition and stuff. And we are able to do that at a much higher and quicker rate than most other um, ways of doing it, either manually or with other resources. We also are able to um, see and pull data from Amazon for advertising costs, for um, for replenishment when your stock is running low. And all of this data works together so that it's actually working together. So you can add your cost of goods sold and then all of the data that you have together, you can see in an easy to read dashboard instead of compiling you know, several different tools and then hoping that you're, <laughs> you're doing, <laughs> I was told there would be no math, right? Hoping that you do your math right in the end. So that that's uh, sort of where I'm at now um, with, uh, with the e-commerce world. Sounds exciting. And hi, tell us what you do at Eva and what is your background? Well, I mean, thank you for that. So I'm the CEO of Eva, and uh, I was one of the guys who founded uh, the Eva platform. And, uh, you know, originally I'm a computer scientist with artificial intelligence background, and I worked as a vice president of Oracle for more than like 15 years. Uh, that was my career with the enterprise software. And a couple of years back, one, one of my great friends, uh, Barry, told me that he's like on Amazon for a decade. And uh, he's also a computer scientist, but he ended up, you know, selling on Amazon as an immigrant in the U.S. And he was telling me like, you know, there are a lot of tools, you know, a lot of different software, but nothing at enterprise grade, like bringing all the data together, mm -hmm. providing a seamless experience, like, like Melissa said. Then we said, okay, why not to create the Eva platform? And we started that, you know, in California, in San Diego. And it's a great ride so far, two years. You know, it was almost like 20 years of an additional career <laughs> for me because I had a nice life in Oracle. You know, it's of course challenging on its own, but it's an enterprise sales life. You know, it's much more flexible right now with the startup world. It's, you know, a lot more interesting and uh, we reached to thousands of customers i you know even just today i i met with like seven new customers and uh, they are all amazon sellers it's super exciting world you know to yeah. be in the amazon world that's what keeps me alive still <laughs> and uh, you know that's uh, you know i just do everything on uh, on eva whatever you know is required that's what i do but i guess the major thing that I do as the CEO is like listening to customers and understanding like what they need and how we can deliver that as fast as possible. 
Very interesting. Okay, so let's first of all talk about Amazon India. And um, you have recently integrated with Amazon India, in fact, just last week. So um, what sort of you know trends are you seeing on Amazon India? Of course, it's too early. You don't have a lot of data. But why did you decide to go on Amazon India in the first place? Were you seeing a lot of demand there or um, you know, sales increasing significantly? What, what are you seeing out there on Amazon India? Right. I mean, I'm going to give you a secret, first of all. Now, you, you're, you are pretty much asking me about the data, but I need to tell you the real reason why we are opening India. Because, uh, I mean, uh, you know, I, when I was, with, you know, with my wife, I think I'm married more than 20 years now. I don't remember how long. But, you know, at some point, of <laughs> course, uh, I was always working too hard and we were living in London. And uh, my wife told me, look, you know, you, we missed our honeymoon for five years, I guess you need to do something about it, you know? <laughs> and it was not right. We didn't miss it, but because I was so busy work, you know, it was only three days. So I said, okay, where should we go for honeymoon? Now that's Magla, you know, India more than I do, but I told her we are going to Varanasi. And he asked me, like, she asked me like, where is Varanasi? And I said, oh, that's a beautiful place. It's the vacation resource. It's a great place. But actually my real reason was it's a great spiritual place. And I wanted to go there and see, you know, uh, how like people are, you know, the culture and everything. And it was a great couple of weeks from uh, Delhi to Agra to Jaipur to Varanasi to Kachangjang Mountains. You know, like we had really a great trip. And I've been to India almost more than 20 times between that time and today. And I really love the Indian culture. So it's always, for me, like a passion. When we started EVA, I was like, let's start with Amazon India. And of course, it, it didn't make sense from a, a business point of view as we are in the U.S. And Amazon U.S. is the biggest uh, market. Uh, uh, but, you know, I always had that passion. And obviously... We did the U.S., uh, Mexico, Canada, and then the whole Europe, and then the whole the Gulf Territory, Middle East. Uh, and finally, we thought, okay, now it's the time. And that's why, you know, like we started with India uh, just because it's the, the next best uh, marketplace for us. But uh, not only that, you know, you know, I mean, it's um, more than 300 million are using, um, you know, Amazon very actively more than 200 million visitors in, in Amazon India. I mean, it's it's becoming like really great market and compared to Amazon US, UK or others, this is like the fastest growing market like Amazon Turkey and mm -hmm. Amazon India are like the fastest growing markets. And uh, very interesting, but like US, there is something very similar, like Amazon is also a little bit, let's say competing with uh, like Walmart, yeah. <laughs> let's say. Because like, uh, you know, Walmart has a, has a company uh, over there as well, you know, kind of acquired. But the Amazon gro growth is much faster. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm just like seeing that is really uh, changing the way the business is, is, is doing, you know, is done in, in, in India, you know, with the e-commerce. Uh, and, you know, in many ways, the e-commerce is even much more advanced compared to the rest of the world, uh, although it's an emerging market, but a lot of people use their mobile phones, they buy things from, um, from the e-commerce marketplaces. I mean, there are like a okay, hundred reasons why we should be <laughs> in India, and we are now well, in India. <laughs> and I, I know that, you know, in, in 2020, they published that the, the increase in revenue from the previous year was 42% higher. And then they were projecting, and now, of course, they don't have final numbers for 2021, but they're projecting it will be 50% higher than the previous year. So, I mean, that's really significant growth. And it's far surpassing um, expectations for Flipkart, which is the, you know, the Walmart um, marketplace for, for India. So that's a, a pretty significant reason to keep our eyes in that direction. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, it's growing really fast. And they have this um, great Indian festival which is sort of similar to Black Friday, Cyber Monday, or maybe Christmas sales um, in India. And uh, that's around the festival of Diwali around October, November. And that has also been record breaking this year. So mm. yeah, quite interesting. But I think in terms of um, the competition in Amazon India, it's a lot more than Amazon US and it's a very price sensitive market. Mm. That's what we found 
um, you can really make a profit on volume. So if you're selling in high volumes um, and if your pro product is uh, well priced and it's competitively priced, then you're going to be, you know, be able to make a profit. Um, but otherwise it's very competitive. It's very price conscious. So that's something that people need to keep in mind if they want to sell in India. And of course, the types of products that sell in India are very different from the types of products that sell in the US. And sometimes I see people, you know, Amazon sellers in the US, they say that, oh, I've got this really good brand that I'm sourcing from India, selling in the US market. Let me also sell the same products in India. That does not work. Because the products that you're sourcing for the U.S. from India are for the U.S. market. They are specifically for the U.S. market, the price points, the colors, the types of products. But if you want to sell on Amazon India, you've got to understand what products are really selling there. And that's why I think a tool like Eva is so useful, because if you're not based in India, there's no way you can tell what's selling and you know, what kind of um, um, metrics people are seeing and what kind of profitability, et cetera, is there. So I think right. your, your tool will be very useful for that, especially if somebody is overseas and they want to sell um, on Amazon India. Um, another thing I think, hi, you mentioned mobile shopping, and that is huge in India. And um, a lot of people, you know, maybe in the second or third, third tier cities, they don't have access to computers or laptops. So they go directly to, you know, they shop directly on their mobile phone. So it's uh, um, almost... I don't know what percentage, but a very large percentage is actually mobile first shopping. So again, very different from uh, some of the other marketplaces like the US, UK, Australia, right. et cetera. Um, yeah, so um, in terms of, you know, what else can you tell us about Amazon India and Eva? So tell us like, what sort of data do you offer to sellers, um, you know, who are selling in the Amazon India marketplace or how do you help them? First of all, okay. Let me rephrase the question. Do you help them decide whether or not they should go to Amazon, they should sell on Amazon India, or do you provide data to them once they are selling on Amazon India? Right. Great question. Great question. And before that, like you mentioned the pricing, and that's very important. One of the things that we have seen with the Indian e-commerce e um, you know, ecosystem not only it is about between Amazon and Flipkart, but a lot of different marketplaces are there. A lot of like people are selling on the web stores and the price sensitiveness is a lot higher compared to Western Europe or US. And you know, if your price doesn't make sense, PPC will not help you or the best image, but you really need to have the right pricing. And this is what actually the core of EVA, and this is the core of what, what we do, is all about dynamic pricing. And that's why the dynamic pricing plays a key role. Now, combining that with your question, we are tracking more than 50 million products right now. Majority of them are in US, but like 25% are in the Europe. And now we are tracking, started tracking all the Indian products. And based on that, uh, you know, like we are not proposing like what should be sold, like we are not doing the sourcing piece of the things or help them to source, but based on the, like Eva always finds the best price to sell any product. As long as there is demand, uh, you know, defining the product price is something that I don't think it is possible to do manually. The best way to do it is like based on the data and that's where the artificial intelligence comes into the picture because there are so many factors that are impacting the price from seasonality to the competitors to similar products to a demand and the trend and the category related uh, information. And that's what needs to be incorporated to find the next best price for tomorrow. And that's what we think is, the, is why EVA will be a great fit and that's also the number one thing that the uh, Amazon Indian sellers need, the best uh, pricing platform for uh, running their Amazon business. And I, I want to add a little more for specificity. Um, once people have their store, then we can pull the data. And that's how, so we get started with them once they connect their store to us. So they're, it's established um they are established sellers. So they don't have to be like a year in or have a certain, um, you know, level 
level of expertise or anything, but they, they do need their store to connect to the, the platform. Okay, that makes sense. So in terms of dynamic pricing, um, how does dynamic pricing affect sales of the product? Does it actually help improve sales? And how does it affect profitability as well? Because if you know the price goes down, then of course your profitability also goes down, but how do you sort of balance sales and profitability while managing in dynamic pricing? That's right, great question. Um, and there are maybe two different uh, ways of looking at it. Number one is like from reseller's perspective in the Indian marketplace, if more people are selling the same product at the same time, I mean, it's similar in US or in Europe, then the major, the most important thing to do is like to win the buy box. And the buy box is that yellow button, like people, you know, click to that buy now button and they, they buy the products. Now, statistically, if, if there is no buy box, if you are not the owner of the buy box, then most likely you can only do 30% of the sales because 70, 80% of the sales is going to the buy box owner. So winning the buy box is the key, uh, you know, key way to increase your sales. So what we do in EVA is to make sure that the sellers win the buy box. That's the number one thing. Now, number two thing is, let's assume you own the buy box, you have the best price. What if like, maybe you can test a price point which is higher than your price, which means that you can increase the profitability because you can even sell the same item with a much better price, but you still own the buy box. And that's where we are maximizing the profits. And that's where EVA is also differentiated because it's all about winning the buy box and increasing the prices uh, so you can still sell the same products with, but with higher profitability. So that's the, the essence of the work for the resellers. Now for the brands and the private labels, it's a totally different story because most of the private labels, they own the buy box 95%. Now there is some 5%, but that's it's still important if the buy box is suppressed by Amazon. For example, for some reason, let's say the Flipkart price for the same Amazon seller is selling a product on Flipkart for uh, let's say 10 rupees and on Amazon it is, it is 15 rupees. If that is happening, then Amazon will suppress the buy box. Why? Because the Flipkart price is much cheaper. Now, if that happens that to take the price down and to get the buy box is still important for the private label. But that's only one of the things. The major thing for a private label is how the demand will, uh, you know, kind of, you know, kind of influence the price. For example, if the demand is increasing uh, for the last yesterday, maybe last week, last month, last quarter, last year, as the demand is increasing, the price should increase. Why? Because there is more demand. If the demand is decreasing, the price should decrease. If the inventory is decreasing, then most likely the, the, the brand owner wants to protect still the out of you know the, the, the sales, but it is okay to sell less and make some more profits because in any case, you're gonna be out of stock. So if you're not able to restock your items, for example, just the data last year, Q4, we had 400 sellers using uh, the inventory based pricing, they were able to make 25% better profits during Q4 as the inventory was going down and there was no way to restock the items because it was not possible as the Christmas was approaching. So the prices went up and they were able to make more money at least and they were able to avoid or delay the uh, stock out issue. So that will be another reason. Now, what about similar reasons? Like one of the things in India that I've seen, a lot of people are selling very similar products. Now, all these similar products, maybe, you know, there is a one product which has a lot of ratings and you are just launching your product. So you want to be always 10% cheaper than your competitor, which is not the same reason, which is also very important, I think, for the Indian marketplace to have some rules or some setting 
where your prices do not exceed your competitors, or maybe you want to be always higher than your competitors because you have the best ratings or best reviews and you don't want to waste you know, profits because of that. So these are all possibilities that can be done with dynamic pricing. That sounds very interesting and very, um, very useful. So um, Amazon also offers dynamic pricing, right? I mean, they have their own tool to, to do that. So how is Eva different from the tool that Amazon offers? And, you know, what are the advantages of using Eva instead of Amazon's own dynamic pricing? So there is, there is no tool for the private labels and brands. So except that Amazon brands, uh, Amazon is using internally for their brands every day, the prices are changing. For the private labels and brands, uh, you know, there is no tool. But for the resellers, there is a tool called Amazon Repricer that is for, for Amazon. And now what this tool does is trying to drop the prices uh, in order to get the buy box. Now, there is a couple of challenges with this tool. First of all, uh, we call it like the race to the bottom. Unfortunately, this tool is like, and it's good for Amazon, good for the marketplaces in general to have a race to the bottom because at the end of the day, the marketplaces care about having the lowest uh, price as possible because that's one of the main reasons why all the consumers go into marketplaces but it's not always the best thing for the seller just to get the the buy box but then each time somebody is like dropping the price drop the price again drop the price again and finally it ends up like making no profits the biggest thing with the uh, with the eva ai or an ai suite is like not only winning the buy box, but trying to increase the prices all the time rather than decrease the prices. And sometimes, like for example, uh, it is not always like dropping the price, but sharing or matching the price. And maybe the competitor is also matching the price. So there is no need to uh, decrease the price anymore. And all these things are more like kind of like playing a poker. That's what the kind of the... <laughs> Uh, the AI machine is doing like trying to see if the competitors are dropping the prices or matching the prices and based on that, always maximizing the profits. But that's for the resellers. Okay, that makes sense. So let's also talk about Q4. And um, we're, we're, of course, still in Q4 and <laughs> Cyber Monday. It's, is it still Cyber Monday? Yes, it is. <laughs> I can't believe it is still today. Yes. <laughs> But what sort of trends are you seeing this year for Black Friday, Cyber Monday? Um, we were talking a bit earlier before we started recording, and um, we're seeing slower sales for some sellers in our community and my own brands as well. I mean, not as high as they were last year. So there is sort of a dip in sales, or maybe some people are saying that their growth rate is, is lower than it was in 2020. But what are you seeing? Because you have so much... Um, you have access to so much data in EVA. So what sort of trends are you seeing? would be interested to know that. Melissa, you want to go ahead or? Well, uh, so I, I can't pull, like, Hi has all this in his head from, from the platform. Um, I, I will say, you know, the conversations I've had with friends and anecdotally, I've had uh, similar discussions. You know, we've had a, a lot of private label guys who have had the same kind of um, response, you know, that, and a lot of it is not necessarily because their product was not doing well or because they didn't get to the first page or something. Most of it has to do with other challenges that they face, like, you know, their lower stock caused them problems logistically getting stuff in. And so they might have lost a little rank and then they worked on getting the rank in or they restocked, but then Amazon didn't check in their stuff. So all of that leading up to Q4 and Black Friday and Cyber Monday caused um, some issues with maximizing their profits. Uh, so again, I mean, I think everyone's having some logistical nightmares right now. Um, but I think overall, what I've heard um, on the private label side is that there's been a lot of difficulty, um, you know, max maximizing their profits. You know, I, I think that most of the people I've talked to have had decreased profits from last year, or like you said, decreased growth, you know, an expectation that it, it would increase year upon year um, that was not met. Right. 
And you know, internally in in Eva, like they call me also H dot AI, which is a high, but also the H with artificial intelligence. <laughs> so I have all the data in my mind, you know, I already keep that data. So, and one of the things, you know, like looking at more than 15 million products uh, results, what I can tell you, first of all, some of the things that are uh, becoming really like the, the business is becoming tougher because the advertising costs increased like 28%. And especially in the last couple of months, uh, and I think that the trend of increasing increased advertising cost will continue in 2022, probably another 20% increase every brand uh, owner should expect, which means that optimizing the cost of advertising, but not only that, the optimizing the overall cost will be important. Number two is we have seen so many um, IPI issues with a lot of sellers, like uh, it's the, um, you know, the inventory performance uh, scores, basically on the Amazon side, uh, which is kind of a hidden algorithm. But at the end, the end result is it is hard to replenish the stack. Let's put it in this yeah. way, because Amazon gives, uh, you know, a certain amount of units uh, to replenish. Now, if you're a new seller, it's not a problem for you. If you're a super uh, top seller, it's not a problem for you. But if like all the sellers between, let's say 20K to up to maybe 500K a month that they are doing, they all have some challenges with the IPI, the performance index and the replenishment related issues. And um, back to the Black Friday, uh, we haven't seen, a, a, you know, like, a huge growth, like I don't think we're going to be seeing like still the data is in analysis because it's that we are still in that uh, period. But I think that compared to last year, the, the data shows me that it is less growing, like growing yeah. less than expected. And I think that one of the other thing is the supply chain issues. So combining, and I don't want to talk about the supply chain issues, but in general, like the cost of uh, you know, shipping and warehousing may be increased by another 20, 25%. Now adding the replenishment challenges, supply chain challenges and advertising challenges. One of the things that I have realized is like the sellers are also not doing a lot of promotions. And, uh, and based on that, like also the, the sales is not going, uh, you know, super up. And uh, because like I see less flexibility in terms of the deals uh, that are promoted, you know, like, and that's uh, maybe another reason why it's a little bit slower than last year. Mm. Right, makes sense. Um, so going into 2022, what advice do you have for um, sellers, for Amazon sellers specifically? What are some of the areas that you think they need to focus on in order to be successful in 2022? Who wants um, to I'll, I'll jump in. I think that it's going to be even more important than ever to do, you know, to optimize your listing so that you get more organic than uh, because the, like I said, the advertising costs are going to continue to rise. And if you can get people who want to click because of the way that you've optimized your listing, you've added video, you, you know, your brand registered, all that stuff, it's, it's going to be much more helpful than just trying to get it, um, you know, just trying to get the clicks um, that that will prove to be very expensive if you're not optimizing for conversion. And then also, you know, there's something to be said for actual branding, right? You know, if you are taking the time to, to actually do branding and, you know, packaging and, you know, not just sell a product, but create a brand, then I think that's going to be much more beneficial to sellers going forward than it has been in the past. You know, the, the world of e-commerce is changing a little bit and certainly the wild west of e-commerce and Amazon is um, is an ever-changing world. So all of the changes that Amazon is, is bringing about is it makes it more challenging, but I also think it helps sellers refine. You know, you pivot and you, um, you refine what you are doing based on the needs of the marketplace and based on the needs of the customers. And as that is changing, I think it's a great opportunity for sellers to pivot and refocus on the things that will help them organically so they're not paying so much. 
I fully agree. That's a great start. I think I would add maybe two things. Um, I mean, on top of that, or maybe three. Number one is like the ACOS optimization is very important. If you have more than like 50% ACOS, like it doesn't go anywhere. So the ACOS needs to go down and uh, optimizing that will be a key challenge, I think, in 2022, given that I mentioned there will be a, an additional 20% increase expected with the CPC. The second thing is um, using the power of pricing, again, for brands, private labels. Today, maybe only 3 4% of the Amazon brands, the, the brands on Amazon are using the power of dynamic pricing. So it's something that anybody can unleash that information and uh, based on that demand-based, trend-based, velocity-based, inventory-based pricing, I think that will play a key role. And the problem is it cannot be done manually unless you have a few SKUs. So if anybody with more than maybe 30, 40 SKUs, it makes sense to or, you know, find a way to dynamically update your prices, which at the end can bring more profits. And that profit can be used to maybe boost the advertising because it's a way of reducing the ACOS by selling more and also then use the same, uh, maybe that profit in order to do more advertising. So that will be the another one. Maybe the last one, I think that in the next six, seven, eight months, the supply chain problem will continue. Uh, the prices of the freight uh, shipping, we see a lot of shipping delays. We were just talking about like uh, New York, um, Houston, like how, you know, how long does it take from Mumbai to, to Houston before the call? And you know, it was like um, maybe on average 35 days from Mumbai to New Jersey or to Houston, Right now, it's kind of increasing every day, like 36, 37, 38 days. The prices of the freight is also uh, fluctuating in the last couple of months. I think that will continue. So having uh, like a streamlined um, you know, um, freight, uh, streamlined uh, shipments, as well as having the right type of a, a 3PL to work with, in order to you know kind of send the items at the right time to amazon i think that will be another optimization area um maybe a last thing sorry i said only the last but this is the <laughs> last after the last because i just re re remembered that i've seen that a lot of private labeled brand sellers they do not optimize their returns uh, interesting area but we are looking at it in the last two months we have seen that Amazon is a way of disposing items for 25 cents, for example, in the Amazon US market. And like the private label sellers are like, if something is returned back to Amazon, what they do is like they pick the, the, the dispose, you know, kind of uh, option and they don't care about that. What we did was like, we did a study and we have seen that you can basically resell all these return items, almost 50% of them in the new condition maybe another 30% in refurbished or like new conditions. Now, which, which means that if you're selling items where the average price is more than $20, you can make a lot of money by just like looking into these returns items and uh, eliminate the ones that needs to be disposed or donated. But it can be another way of like making some more money because every little single penny helps uh, to, you know, to spend that into advertising or listing optimization or brand building. So uh, there is a lot of things to be optimized. It's an optimization year uh, to make more money. That is some great advice. And you briefly mentioned your 3PL services as well in Houston. And we were talking about shipping from India and um, how, so we found shipping to New Jersey, the most cost effective in terms of time as well. It's the fastest. So, um, but what about from China? So, you know, from, from let's say any of the major ports in China, Shenzhen or Hong Kong or Ningbo, how does shipping to Houston compare with shipping to let's say California? Do you have any insight into that? 
Yes, and I can tell you right away, it makes no sense. So, okay. <laughs> so what, and that's the reason why we we have two warehouses. One is in Houston, and the other one is in California, because all our um, the private label sellers or Chinese sellers that work with us they ship to our 3pl um, warehouse in california it makes a lot of sense to ship from china to east coast will be an additional 15 20 days uh, if if you're lucky and it, it will be much more costly so to california makes a lot of sense uh, and what we are doing is like the europeans and the indians they ship to houston uh, and the Chinese, uh, you know, manufacturers or with suppliers, they ship to California, and it makes the the best uh, use of uh, the uh, the the warehouses. Now, one thing is, of course, the match, like the the prices. Like we have a also we we provide um, you know the freight uh, services. We always match uh, the price with New Jersey uh, shippings with Houston. The reason why we decided to do it in Houston is because that helps us to make the 3PL service much cheaper. It's typically 20, 30% cheaper compared to New Jersey, Delaware area. And uh, we already match the price in terms of freight. So it makes a lot of sense. But even beyond the price, because price is always the number one thing, but the number two is how to make sure that you know the 3PL is doing the job right. Meaning that if do they really have the right tools, for example, when to restock, what items to restock. And this is where I think there is a lot of intelligence that can be used, uh, especially if it is artificial, it will be also cheaper and better because what we are doing is like, we have a replenishment forecasting system in our warehouses. And it's used for free by our warehouse staff as well as uh, the Amazon sellers. But they can easily see what needs to be restocked every week based on not only out of stock, but also uh, based on the profit velocity. So we restock the items which are the most profitable first without you know, ignoring the ones which are going out of stock. So there is an optimization algorithm there but it works autonomously because all the data is already there. You know, there is no need like for a human just to say, oh, I need to restock five units from this product X because the data is already there. So my dream in 2022 for Eva is to make the whole 3PL completely autonomous. So once you send all the stuff from India, for example, to our Houston warehouse, you don't need to worry about like when to restock. We just need to worry about maybe sending another shipment from India to uh, to the warehouse, maybe three months later, six months later, but the stock will be autom automatically replenishing the, the, the stock from 3PL will automatically replenish the Amazon FBA stock, which we are able to do. I, I'm not sure if anybody else is able to do that. That's kind of a unique experience that we want to provide to the Amazon sellers. Yeah, I haven't heard of anybody else, you know, automating the whole 3PL drip feed to Amazon process. And that would really save a lot of time for sellers, because currently I know so many sellers, especially during Q4, when they restock limits are so low, um, yeah. they're just sitting there and making shipping plans and, you know, deciding <laughs> how many pieces to send in. And yeah, so that's definitely very time consuming. Yeah. Um, okay. I mean, I would like to even tell you one more thing, because yes. you just said shipping plans. Yes. Like the system that we are like, you know, we are using now, it will be like a one click from Eva to create like first check what is needs to be restocked and then click, create your shipping plan, upload to Amazon, that's it. So that will be also done automatically. That's oh, kind yeah. of like what we are working on. Yeah. So we really want to eliminate this to 10 minutes job every day, just to check. Like we're going to do it anyway, 90% autonomous, 10% warehouse stuff will do it, but the Amazon seller will be just watching the game. If they want to be like, you know, enter in and do something, they can do it, but it will be a 10 minutes job. That's the dream. We're going to make this work like starting from January. That's awesome. It's um, AI at, at work. <laughs> AI at its maximum. <laughs> You're living up to your name, H.AI. <laughs> 
<laughs> awesome. Well, thank you so much, Hi and Melissa, for joining me here today. Really good insights for sellers. And uh, guys, check out Eva. What's the URL? Is it eva.com or? Oh, it's that's eva.guru. Eva. Guru. guru, yes. Yeah. Eva.guru. That's right. right. Okay. So eva. Another, guru. another guru. Another, <laughs> another guru. guru. <laughs> the guru of all gurus. <laughs> Yeah, so we'll also put a link in the show notes, but uh, check out eva.guru and uh, especially the dynamic pricing um, aspect of Eva. That seems very, very useful. But thank you so much, Melissa and Hi, for joining us. And um, we'll see you around. All right. Take care.